Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And welcome to another edition of uh, Hawaii in Uniform. I'm your host, Calvin Griffin. And for those of you who may not have seen the program before, here we talk about a lot of different things concerning our veterans, military, community, and uh, other related things also. We also like to share things, um, or individuals who um, are veterans in the community who are doing a lot of great things. And um, one of the individuals who was working to make things better for his fellow veterans is uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Gwynn. Hey, good, uh, good afternoon, actually. Uh, <laughs> aloha, everybody. Great to be back on the show. Right. Yeah, you've been on the program before. And, yeah, a couple uh, of times now. Yeah. So uh, for those who may not have missed your segment before, mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what are you into right now? Uh, well, currently, um, I'm an 11-year military vet. I served from uh, February 1995 to November 2006. Uh, served in two different branches. Served with the Army. I served with the Navy. Um, Army Reserves, Army National Guard, um, and did a wider range of different um, jobs and specialties within the military. Um, got out in 2006, and from that point on, I've been working actively with different veterans organizations. Um, currently, I work with uh, the Fleet Reserve Association as a board of directors. Um, also, I'm a part of Team Rubicon, which is a veteran organization that is crafted to do and perform disaster relief and emergency uh, relief, not just within the United States, but also internationally now. So we can go anywhere in the world and provide medical uh, assistance and rebuilding. Um, currently, we're rebuilding in Texas, and we're also doing work in uh, Puerto Rico. Okay. Is this an NGO, or how does that work, or what kind of organizations? Um, they were titled a... Um, 501c3, so, well, not a, a pure 501c3, but we are a nonprofit organization, but we're veterans uh -huh. mainly. Uh, <clears throat> we have about 90% of us are veterans, and the other, as we refer to as kick ass civilians. Uh -huh. So these individuals are like your EMTs, your police officers, your firefighters, um, other individuals with certain skill sets that make them um, assets uh -huh. in emergency situations such as natural disasters. Okay, so with the organization, do you guys work with the Red Cross, FEMA, things like nature, or you help to augment anything? Or um, Normally, what uh, Team Rubicon will do is they'll come in and they'll aid and assist if and where be they are needed. <laughs> um, mainly, uh, like within the hurricanes that was, was recently uh, uh, devastated Puerto Rico, we're currently going in and actually helping them rebuild, mm -hmm. like physically rebuild shelters, hospitals, schools, homes. Um, so we also uh, provide those type of resources, manpower, right, um, for free. So I mean, we, it's totally free. We go in and we just help out. Yeah. Uh, you say free as far as with the volunteers, do they supply most of their own equipment, or how does that work out? Or? Um, most of our uh, equipment, like the larger equipment, from what I understand, is supplied through donations. Mm -hmm. uh, but the military members, the veterans themselves, and the volunteers, mm -hmm. um, the only thing that they're really compensated for is their travel. Right. Um, and Team Rubicon has worked out um, certain uh, MOUs, memorandums of understanding with certain travel agencies and travel companies like Delta and America. Um, airlines that provide tickets, mm -hmm. free tickets for our members to go to the disaster areas. Yeah. Um, and then once we get there, we kind of just set up. We have, you know, tents, uh, reefers, and the likes, or, you know, we might stay with the individuals there mm -hmm. um, in the disaster area. Yeah. So. Okay. Do you look for people, uh, if they want to join this um, effort? Mm -hmm. um, is there, are the classes, or what do you do to prepare people? Are you looking for people who are already prepared through their military experiences or other related? Um, well, things? the the only real criteria um, would be you're a vet mm -hmm. or you're one of those identified classes of uh, emergency personnel that I've already had or received some type of training, like police officers, firefighters, EMTs, mm -hmm. doctors or nurses, which everybody's always in need of doctors and nurses. Right. Um, but on the military side, um, 
it doesn't matter what branch you served in, what your, your uh, job specialty was. We also have in place online learning, mm -hmm. and then periodically throughout the regions, because we're broken up into regions, like right. this is Region 9, Hawaii, and California, and Arizona, and New Mexico, and um, we have training. Mm -hmm. So, um, like we have chainsaw trainings, which is put on by the Department of the Bureau of Land Management. Mm -hmm. So, the wildland firefighters will come out and train us how to operate chainsaws, and um, then there's other training that's online to get you brought up to speed for, um, there's also background checks, mm -hmm. um, but communication styles, how to operate, mm -hmm. um, comms, how to effectively communicate. Right. So, Speaking of communication with the varied um, ethnic groups over here, are you looking for people with language skills? Because that's, of course, going to be very important in a um, emergency always. situation anyhow. Yeah. Always. Always looking for anybody that has even the least, least, bit, least bit of uh, language skills because even if the individual is attempting to mm -hmm. and has some type of rapport with the indigenous population, then it helps us with our job. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it shows faith. It shows that we're actually here to aid. We're here to, we're here to help mm -hmm. and we're trying. Yeah. But uh, we're always looking for people with um, any type of uh, language skills. Yeah. Speaking of communications also, um, I know spoken word, but of course we have uh, some people who are um, impaired as far as hearing. Mm -hmm. um, so sign language uh, specialists, people of that nature, does that uh, come into play also? Or could it? It, it could always come into play. Yeah. Um, the only issue with that is like if you we're working in say a identified AO area of operation mm -hmm. where there is limited resources as far as the individual knowing sign language. Okay, yeah. Um, so, but yeah. anyone with any type of language skills, please look on our website, uh, Google Team Rubicon. If you're a military active veteran, uh, reservist, National Guard, police officer, firefighter. EMT, divers, um, check it out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I think we'd think in an emergency situation, it would be obvious what help would be required in a lot of cases anyhow, then afterwards as far as the, the follow-up, that's when certain language skills or whatever would kick in, I guess. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, especially if you're trying to find individuals' families. Yeah. You know, if they're displaced, like uh, the tsunami that hit in um, the Pacific uh, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, where it devastated uh, Madagascar and, and some of the outlying islands. Um, mm -hmm. People were just totally displaced. Yeah. Um, and you gotta try to find, hey, where are your family from, you know, mm -hmm. on the map, where are you from? And um, so, yeah, you definitely need those language skills. Yeah, okay. Well, I know there's a lot of things that uh, we talk frequently also offline and all that, you know, so, um, again, exchanging information, like uh, there's a lot with the veterans we, try to share information. Some of it, uh, of course, comes from official sources, and other stuff is like through um, uh, learned experiences, because sometimes, like say, you can go through a system and uh, you can be instructed to be informed about one thing as far as factually how certain things um, go. Um, you know, that, that also comes into play also. I know there's something that you wanted to share about uh, there's some piece of legislation that uh, came out lately or something that affects the vets. Well, this one, um directly affects active duty members, but um, a lot of vets have family members that are active duty. Yeah. Um, and this also affects active duty members, um, beneficiaries, mm -hmm. uh, and dependents. Mm -hmm. And what it is is a couple of days ago, um, acting director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Mick Mulvaney, who is the acting, who is the director of the Office of Management and Budget, has proposed uh, a, I guess you could say, watering down of the Military Lending Act. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Military Lending Act states that uh, military members and their dependents um, can't basically can't be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't go in and say, hey, you know, I want to get a loan at one of these payday lenders or these quick loans, or you go to purchase an automobile. Mm -hmm. They can't stick the military member with this outrageous fees, and they can't um, put on these additive costs like um, gap insurance and, and the such, and then tie it all in. Because let's face it, um, uh, automobile um, dealerships, you know, especially around bases, you know, mm -hmm. here at us, uh, uh, 
Schofield or Bliss or Bragg or wherever you're at, they know how much the enlisted member makes. Yeah. Before they even walk in the door, they know exactly how much that man or that soldier or that woman that they make. Mm -hmm. um, and this is designed to protect them. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the acting director of Mulvaney has came out and stated that um, he does not know if it is their responsibility to enforce. To enforce. The law, the uh, act. Yeah. So, um, which we all know with, with some common sense that all those agencies, they might not enforce the law. That's why we have the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. That's their jobs. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're looking to, instead of being proactive, yeah. they're looking to become reactive. Instead yeah. of going in and saying, hey, we understand that you're this type of lender outside of banks. So mm -hmm. anything outside of a bank, the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau can step in and say, hey, we want to review your lending policies. Yeah. So that's a proactive state. Right. And they want to move over to a reactive saying, well, we'll just, we'll just take on complaints. Like if the service member files a complaint, yeah. which at that point in time, you know it's already too late a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah, because once it gets to that point, the next thing you know, the um it's a responsibility, or they put the onus on the service member to go ahead and prove that you didn't, uh, that you were taken advantage of. You right. know? And from what you're stating with this, is that um, it's plausible deniability on the part of the administrator or whoever this gentleman is, you know, to say, well, you know, uh, we'll get around to it if it happens or whatever, one of the deals, anyhow. And the unfortunate part is there are a lot of people out there who are more than willing to take advantage of service members, you know, uh, because they know that if it even results in court, you can be legally right and morally wrong and vice versa, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that's what a lot of people get into, you know. Uh, most people are trusting, or you know, but you have to read the fine print, you know. But the thing is, you don't want our service members to be put in that position in the first place, you know. And like, say, for this, it seems like, yeah, the watering down or... Um, you know, they're just not, they're not living up to their responsibility as overseers or, you know, protectors of the military personnel here. Not at all. And several retired generals and acting generals and higher up uh, officials have stated that um, it's just not about protecting the service member. It's also about um, uh, our force being prepared to do their job. So if an uh, individual has a top secret security clearance and they get upside down mm. on a automobile loan, guess what's the first thing that goes? Yeah. Their, their security clearance. So now there's, there, that unit, that organization is a man down or multiple people down because they have all been taken advantage of. So it's, it's a manning issue. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things that, you know, we as taxpayers, pay for these individuals to be trained up and to receive these security clearances to do their jobs, and yet, at the same time, if they get upside down in a loan, which is provided to them by some dealership, and they get upside down in it, now where did that tax dollar go? Because now that person's lost their security clearance and can't do their job. Yeah, well, in a way, it would be like a form of extortion, because if I, you know, came and claimed that you owed me a lot of money or whatever it was, you know, mm -hmm. saying I'm going to take you to court, in the meantime, like say, what's going to happen? Like say, you're that interim, you know, by the time you clear your name. So a lot of, I guess, it's a lot of service members would say, okay, well, look, I'm, I don't, I can't afford to lose my clearance, uh, my deployment options, and everything else. So therefore, I'll pay up, you know. Exactly. And I think that's what a lot of them have. But you know, they know what's going on. They know how to work the system. Like say, the milk, and mm -hmm. I don't say this loosely, but like say, yeah, to take full advantage of you know, our service members, you know, and I think we need to have more advocates that will enlighten our members to what's going on, especially within the system and uh, like say on the military side, you know. Well, one of the, one of the main parts of this piece of legislation um, outside of, of protecting the service member, mm -hmm. it provides the service member with the ability to take these individuals to court. Yeah. On well, in the civilian sector, mm -hmm. nine times out of ten, the civilian doesn't have the same protections. Mm -hmm. They have to go through what's called force arbitration. Yeah. So the lending institution, whether it be a payday loans or whoever, brings in their, for lack of a better word, their guy, yeah. their person, mm -hmm. and says, you have to go through force arbitration. And this individual, who might have a legal background, might not. Yeah. Well, yeah. speaking of scams, we'll get into this conversation in a moment. We're going to take a short break, uh, but um, 
stay tuned, please. And uh, again, we're Hawaii in uniform, and uh, we'll be here. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff, but I really like energy stuff, so I'm gonna keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're gonna talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're gonna definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Okay, you're back with the Hawaii, bull um, excuse me, <laughs> Hawaii in uniform, excuse me. Um, and we'll continue our conversation with Jeremy. Um, yeah, this thing about the continue um, along the vein of um, taking advantage, you know. It's one thing I found over here recently, uh, as far as like we have a lot of veterans who are in situations like homeless situations, things of that nature. And um, it seems like there are a few of the, um, how can I say, housing organizations out there. I got this thing going, and this may, this may not be as widespread, but I, I'm more familiar, I, there's quite a few people I talk to where the situ situation is you get behind on rent. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they'll serve you with papers. I mean, I know a, guy, a gentleman that recently just, he was walking up to the office and said, okay, I want to get things squared away. And they said, no, we're taking you to court, okay? They take him into court, and what happens is that now he has to, if he is found liable, automatically he has to pay for the legal fees and everything else. Mm -hmm. So therefore, what happens, he goes into court, all right? Got the attorney there, all right? So what happens is the, uh, if the judgment is in the favor of the plaintiff for the housing, on top of the legal fees that he has to pay to the, or he or she has to pay to the attorney, then there's the other part that goes on where what they actually do is the manager will walk them through, or so you walk them through the apartment for the, when they're evacuating, uh, eva excuse me, leaving the place anyhow. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what would happen is that the manager will tell them to sign off on this document, we'll fill it in later on, all right? Mm. So you have to go to court a second time. The second time, what would happen is that you'll have a problem with, they'll get you for everything. Whether you've got to go ahead and, like, say, repaint the place, the, all kind of things that you did not originally, you know, that acknowledge that wasn't there. So what happens, the judge will say, okay, well, you signed off on it, therefore, you're responsible. So on top of the back payments and the possibility of having your credit rating, um, you know, affected, mm -hmm. all right? You gotta pay these $800, like say, for the legal fees, you know? And therefore, you know, and this seems to be a common place because what happens is that they have a regular stream of veterans come through there, guaranteed, like say, with their retirement and everything else, this is what's happening, you know? Mm -hmm. And like say, it may not be as wi widespread, but it's, it's going out there that's prevalent enough where people have to be aware of what's going on. And I think that needs to be addressed also because, in a way, that is a scam. You know, unfortunately, there are too many people out there who are willing to take advantage of veterans. Um, we, with all the veterans we have over here, um, you know, it just, it's like open season in a way, you mm -hmm. know. And I think it definitely, definitely needs to be addressed. But that's something that a lot of veterans or people out there may be aware of. And if you are aware of anything that happened along that line, Give me a call here, and like I say, I'd like to know about it. And uh, we're going to see about what we can do to address that issue also. And like I said, there's many more, many more things also. We don't want to be negative here, but the thing is, if there are issues out there in the community that affect our veterans and even the other homeless people or people, viewers in general, who are having these different issues, we need to address it. I mean, we need to be more proactive in so many different ways. I think there's a lot of unsung heroes out there to try to do the best they can, but we need to network as far as the community, to identify what the problems are, and take it from there. So, um, you know. Well, definitely, you know, <clears throat> uh, the old saying goes, uh, trust but verify. Yeah. So, I mean, we can, as veterans, we can, we can put forth our, our best foot and our best efforts, and when we're trying to take care of ourselves, 
<clears throat> and we're saying, oh, this is a great setup. These organizations say that they cater to veterans. Mm -hmm. um, if they say they cater to veterans, like I said, trust but verify. Yeah. You know, talk with the individuals, make sure that, you know, read the documents. You know what? In fact, if you don't trust them that much, or even if you ran across them, go and talk to some other veterans. Um, go find uh, one of your local VFWs, find one of your local OVCs here, Oahu Veterans Center, uh, or one of your uh, veterans organizations that you might be a part of, and say, hey, do we have anybody here that has a legal background? Uh, or at least can help me muddle through this contract or whatever. You know, but trust but verify. Yeah, got to be very careful now, you know, even um, with all the different organizations, even then, you know, um, Trust but verify. Yeah, we uh, have a bad apple. Yeah, we have a yeah. few, but <laughs> we got that's some. another story there. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I said a lot of things that they can want to go ahead and get out there, but one thing I want to go ahead and share is that the um, on the eighth of um, November we have the uh, Hero Remembrance uh, Run, Walk, or Roll um, event that's taking place. If you um, want to take part in this. It's going to be, again, on the 8th of November, and it starts at the Pacific Aviation Museum. Um, if you're an ID card holder, there's no problem getting over there. But if you are a civilian or you don't have the proper credentials, what you can do is go to Nimitz Gate to the security office over there, and they will issue a pass or give you the appropriate documents to um, be able to participate in that. And um, again, this is open to um, everybody that uh, wants to do this. Um, once a year, what they do is they have the boots. I don't know, if, for those of you who may not have seen it, this is a uh, remembrance of all the individuals um, associated with Hawaii that um, uh, were killed in combat or lost their lives in the service of the country. And when you see the rows and rows and rows of boots out there, uh, it really hits home exactly, puts a human face on it. Um, that's the only thing I can say, but uh, it is really something worthwhile and it's a good chance for you to show your appreciation and thanks for those who have uh, paid the ultimate price. Uh, have you seen that? You've been over, haven't you? Uh, I haven't been over to that one yet. Yeah. I haven't been over that one yet. Mm -hmm. um, but to, to tag on to that one, also on uh, August 26th, uh, which is a Sunday, yeah. uh, there will be a Spartan race. So this is for all your active duty members, uh, veterans. Uh, friends and family, uh, it's a, it'll be a three-mile sprint. It's an obstacle course, uh -huh. so if you want to get your mud on, as they so they say, they want to get out there and get muddy. Um, it'll be at uh, Kuloa, uh, Kuloa, Kuloa, the ranch, the ranch. <laughs> it'll be at the ranch, uh, Kuloa Ranch, yeah. uh, Kaneohe. Um, around I think the start time is around 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, 0800. Um, and there'll also be an opportunity to meet uh, Team Rubicon members yeah. um, and other veterans organizations that will be out there. Yeah. So that'll be a nice one. Well, I thought the Spartan run was just going down to Ala Moana during the holiday season to try to shop down there, you know? Yeah, either that one or Halloween. <laughs> try to get downtown through Halloween or Christmas. And it's, okay. it's, it's, it's uh, a also, yeah. <laughs> also um, as far as uh, access to the base, um, Effective 1 October, there will be some changes. Um, we'll have some information up on that for you. But um, yeah, if you are a veteran and you've been trying to get on the base, of course, uh, if you're retired, uh, you have your ID card, that'll get you on. But their policies have changed now where you're gonna have to have a different type of uh, ID um, and you can go to uh, the military base, either up at the um, Spark Matsunaga Center, ambulatory care, and um, ask them up there, and also the Army Garrison uh, Control Center. And also you can call the Oahu Veterans Center down at um, Foster Village, talk to Claire. Uh, her number is 422-4000, and she can give you some more information about what's happening. But with this change, you want to make sure you're prepared for this, that if you do need to have access to the base, that you get this card, or the CAC card, as they call it, mm -hmm. uh, before 1 October. So um, that's a very important part. And you have a card on you? Yes, I sure do. Um, okay. So for those service members, um, this is the one that's going to get you on base for um, Tripler and the Veteran Center there. Um, this one right here will no, be, no longer be accepted after October 1st. But you probably want to keep this one 
in case you do any traveling to the mainland, because this one is going to get you into the other VA centers if you find yourself in need within the mainland of the other 50 states. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so now, um, yeah, that's very important. The way things are changing anyhow, to be having access to the base or other um, types of services, you know, is very important anyhow. Um, hopefully there'll be more, we'll get some more information out there in the future about some of the other things. We're going to try to keep it steadily updated on a lot of things, but there are a lot of different sources out there that veterans can go to. Uh, again, I mentioned the Oahu Veterans uh, Center. They have a website up there. And you can, um, it's uh, very informative. A very, it's a great group they have down there anyhow. Okay, also, um, unfortunately, we have um, the issue of suicides, you know, that comes up. And one of the yes. things that um, we have the Veterans Crisis Hotline. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if you know someone who is, is of, in immediate distress, of course, you always call 911. But if you're a veteran and there is time, like say, to react or whatever, then uh, the number they have is 1-800-273-8255, and that's 800-273-8255. Um, but um, again, that's another issue, like I say, that um, it still need to be dealt with, and you know, we're still losing a lot of not only active duty individuals, but also in the veterans community, there seems to be a lot of um, unfortunate incidents, you know, that are not being addressed. I know they were trying to address these many issues, but um, sometimes it's still falling a little bit short, you know, and if you have a family member or, you know, even yourself that is contemplating this, um, you know, sometimes you don't have time to work through this system. We just need something that is really more immediate than, yeah, no, I, yeah. Well, there was a uh, recent article yeah. that popped up on my radar and it was talking about, um, one of the things is uh, that oftentimes, as we as vets, as soon as we get out of the military, uh, we tend to isolate ourselves. Yeah. You know, we're like, you know what, I just want, don't want to be around people. And then you start going down that rabbit hole that you don't want to be around any people. Right. Um, and that's one of the, the first telltale signs that, hey, uh, you actually want to be around people. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be, as we say, silly villains or civilians, uh, yeah. but you need to seek out uh, other veterans, at right. least. Okay, on that note, we're getting down to the wire. I want to thank you for coming on the program. Uh, we'll do some follow-up stuff in here. I think there's still a lot of very important things that need to be addressed. Like I say, when I, I really stress that, can't stress that enough, need, all right? And again, being involved in it. You know, even if you haven't served a day in the military, find out what's going on. Because like I say, we do owe it to our men and women who are serving us. There are a very small percentage that, like I say, represent all of us around the world. And I want to thank you, viewers, for tuning into the program. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, and all I can say is, thanks for having tune me. Tune in next time. God bless. And until that time.